All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm Haley Hughes and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm a design director at Nike on the design systems team. Uh, Recently, sorry, Haley. Sorry, uh -huh. Haley, to interrupt you, sorry to interrupt you. I think that we cannot see your slides yet. Oh, okay. Hmm. So there is this present uh, button somewhere. Yeah. I, always, I always lose it as well. Thanks for letting me know. Let's make sure, sure. we can see them. I think Are we're we... seeing the presenter mode, but not the screen. Oh, that's about right, Amanda. Yeah, all right, that's all good. I'm disappearing again. Let's pretend it never happened. And <laughs> Haley, off you go, please. All right, great. Thank you for that, Vitaly. Um, so again, I'm Haley. And um, just to tell you a little bit about uh, a recent experience I had, um, I, I recently interviewed 10 people who lead design system teams at large in-house companies. And their titles were UX manager, design manager, program director, senior director of engineering, even head of design. And so one reason why I reached out to these people is because recently one of my reports asked me what moving into management is like on design systems. And I told them that for me, it was about letting go of control of some decisions in order to have more energy to put towards growing people. Uh, one of the most exciting parts of management is that moment when you look back year over year at those incredible growth that happens of individuals on your team. So I was wondering if that's what lights me up. Uh, what else inspires people to move into leadership? There's also a personal reason why I reached out to those people. I know what it's like firsthand to have limitations put on your career because of other people's perception of your role or your capabilities. That's a really challenging place to be. It can be lonely and confusing. And I think there's a lot of myths that need to be busted about design systems leaders and teams and what they're capable of. Here's some that I've heard in my career. Design system leaders don't make as big of an impact because they only manage one team. They don't understand product thinking and customer experience because they only make components. They're not accountable to business results because they're infrastructure people and internal overhead. Leaders don't have enough experience with cultivating culture because they're only focused on the tools. They don't have experience with collaboration because they act like an ivory tower. Now, if you're hearing any of these things within your organization, I'm here to offer you six jobs that you can do to actively debunk these myths. We all know that design system teams and leaders know the organization better than anyone else, but we have to help other people realize this too. And I do truly believe this not only from my experience, but also from hearing from leaders who I spoke with who collectively have about 75 years of combined experience in design systems. But before I tell you about their experiences, I'd like to tell you about my first job, answering phones. Hello, you've reached Union Square Cafe. How may I assist you? It's still as likely to be what you would hear if you call the restaurant today as you might have over a decade ago when I worked there. And why is that? Well, they designed a system for how we respond to every call. There were things that we all said the same way, and then there was room to add our personality. Except for one thing, no negative language. It seemed like such a small detail, avoiding words like no, not, don't, won't, can't, shouldn't. But it was hard not to say those words. At first, I thought it wouldn't matter. Some people answering the phones would sort of ignore the system and say those words anyways. But I stuck with it, and eventually I got pretty good at it. Surprisingly, people would call back and ask to speak to my manager. But instead of complaining, they would rave that myself or one of my teammates had helped them, even if yes meant referring them to another restaurant or finding them a reservation on a different date. The point is, if you're designing a system, thinking happens at every altitude, big and small. The intention of how can we cultivate a culture of hospitality turns into a principle. Hospitality is about always finding the yes, which turns into a decision. Avoid using negative language on phone calls with guests, which turns into an outcome. Guests rave about their experience. And this kind of structure is a good example of how leaders help people define purpose, first principles, and build scaffolding that turns good decisions into great outcomes. Over the years, what we've defined as design systems has changed. 
At one point, maybe it was a UI kit and some guidelines being used as a reference tool. Then people started coding components, and so design systems became released and delivered like a product. And today, some companies have a system of systems that are being maintained by multiple teams. This has led to design systems as a community of practice, where systems are a platform for scaling decisions and assets across the enterprise. And there's a lot at stake when decisions get scaled. And that's why we need design system leadership. Design system leadership is the practice of enabling people to make good decisions that can be scaled. And without leadership, design systems can become a force multiplier for scaling harmful decisions. And I know this because I've seen it happen at many organizations. For example, I was once mentoring a designer who designed a website where it took six clicks to find the phone number for customer support. And when I asked her why she designed it that way, she told me that she'd been asked by people more senior than her to make that phone number on the website less obvious. When I asked her why they asked her to do that, she said that it was because the business put an incentive system in place that rewarded support the support team based on how few calls were coming in. And she knew that those phone calls coming in could affect people's safety, but she felt helpless to do anything about it. Having a leader advocating for change and guiding her to challenge the incentive system is the difference between scaling harmful decisions and scaling good ones. So how do people start their leadership journey? People getting started in design systems have different backgrounds. A common theme is being hybrid. And this means trying on many different hats and growing interdisciplinary skills, such as product design, user experience, accessibility, organizational design, operations, visual design, front-end development. And with those diverse experiences comes more understanding and empathy for your teammates. There are certain moments in one's career that tend to be that catalyst for moving into systems. Across different layers of the customer experience stack here, leaders described what inspired their interest in moving into design systems. So Jared at Shopify said that he made the move into systems work because it enabled him to zoom out and look at the user experience more holistically. Lindsay at Lyft told me that, uh, that in her past life, she was making brand style guides at an agency. And when she would try to hand off that quality work, it never seemed to get fully adopted. And so she decided to move in-house to be the founding designer of a design systems team. Jules kept asking herself, how could I be designing something if I don't understand how my designs are built? So she pivoted into front-end development and eventually started a design system at Credit Karma. Mirko at IBM had been doing organizational transformation, and he wanted to understand why teams were or weren't shipping products successfully. And that research led him into design systems. For me personally, my path was also nonlinear. I had skills in graphic design and actually local food systems, which were transferable to design systems. Everyone has their own journey, and there's no one path. It's also evident that at every layer of the customer experience is impacted by the decisions being made by design systems teams. From where we're sitting, we're able to see the relationship between the front and the backstage of the customer experience. When you work on design systems, there are people who assume that they know what you do, but in reality, they have no clue. And here are some examples to prove this. One leader said, when I introduced myself as working on systems, the first thing that people think of is, oh, you're the component library guy. And whatever actually actual work that I'm trying to do with those teams gets clouded by their perception of our components. Another leader said, people come to me believing that I can solve any type of issue. For example, the CEO will send me a screenshot of the app and he'll say something is ugly and he'll say, what's going on here? And I have to point him to the team that can actually fix it. These misunderstandings highlight why a big part of the job is defining what design systems are and what they mean for your company. Here are many ways that leaders define design systems when I ask them. Now, it doesn't matter if your definition is up here. What matters is that you align with your stakeholders on the scope of your team's work and the edges of the system. This part of the job never ends. So how else do design system leaders spend their days? Before, maybe you were doing craft work, writing code, giving support, designing the system. But as you grow into management, there's a shift to operational work. You're enabling customers, teams, and the business. 
Based on my interviews and my own experiences, I think there are six jobs that design system leaders need to do well, regardless of their work context. Job number one, leaders need to champion quality. And this means ensuring great customer experiences are being delivered without having to be the one to do it. Leaders describe system teams as shepherds of quality, putting standards in place for how all teams can improve product craft and user experience. And this includes requirements around usability, accessibility, performance, visual design, globalization, artificial intelligence, and even ethical design, and establishing different programs and practices that help teams meet those requirements. At Dropbox, Lauren's passion for up-leveling craft led her to co-create critique practices with async updates. And she said that getting visibility into work early led to more outbound support rather than waiting for people to come to office hours after most of the decisions had already been made. Why does this matter? Well, because without design systems representation at the highest levels championing the customer experience, a business will build a lower quality product slower. Building practices such as gathering requirements and facilitating critiques is actually how you drive quality without having to sacrifice speed. Which brings me to job number two, leaders need to manage change. Managing change means enabling people to adopt a new behavior or new experience with as little friction as possible. It means creating awareness about the change, training teams on the resources and tools needed to make that change and engaging customers in feedback in order to learn how it went. According to Lindsay at Lyft, it's hard to massive manage massive change without upsetting people. Last year, her team undertook a huge brand refresh, and she described what it took to migrate everything over to the new style. On the surface, the change was as easy as flipping a switch and being like, oh, it magically works. But behind the scenes, she was getting on everyone's roadmap, planning the QA and testing, making sure things weren't breaking, and meeting with every single team affected by the change, which probably felt like the entire org. As leaders, we have a tendency to boil the ocean. We have to be able to uh, boil the ocean one gallon at a time. Even though uh, design systems can power changes that touch every surface at the 30,000 foot level, the actual work that it takes to manage change happens at the 30 foot level. And as it turns out, we have to spend a lot of our time at that altitude. At IBM, they had a grand vision to unify all the pattern libraries in one place, but that change wasn't as simple as it sounded. The first question that Mirko got was, what do you mean when you say pattern? And this led to research audits examining all the so-called patterns that existed and looking for commonalities between them. Then came several debates and eventually a shared definition for patterns and their attributes. Without these smaller decisions, the big idea to put everything in one place would be impossible. Being thoughtful about the changes that you put in the hands of customers is critical to leadership. Diana said that doing this put her in a position to eventually lead all of design at GitHub because product managers saw that she could handle large rollouts and manage change at scale. Job number three, enable people. Enablement means giving someone the power, the tools, the resources to do something and involves making things possible for people and helping them reach their fullest potential. One way that we do this is through coaching. In the context of design systems, that means we're guiding individuals or groups to accomplish goals and solve problems. And that involves listening too. It involves paying attention to people's tone and their energy and their feelings and recognizing them and the things that are holding them back. It involves simple questions that encourage people to reflect and we're aiming them in the right direction without necessarily giving them the answer. Stephanie, who is most recently at Salesforce, said that working on systems, we tend to be task focused. And that just do it voice in our head tempts us to knock out the small things that we're good at. But when we answer support questions on Slack or we're busting bugs, instead of enabling others on our team to do it, we hold everyone back from growing. We have to give people the space to learn from trial and error. When enabling others, it's important to strike a balance between being collaborative and inserting yourself too much. Lauren at Dropbox shared this great coaching technique that she's learned. She said that instead of gatekeeping systems and saying, please don't do that, we can ask teams, help me understand why you're doing that. And if someone's struggling, we can help them by saying, I can show you a better way. 
In design systems, we can also guide through facilitation. Mirko shared that at IBM, he's put together training courses around customer experience-led leadership and systems thinking. And at IBM, this education is used to coach senior business leaders. We're talking about general managers, senior vice presidents on understanding what their role is in a human-centered organization. Job number four, leaders need to create connections. This means building enduring relationships and trusted collaborations with many teams across the business. The best metaphor that I heard for this came from Lauren uh, at Dropbox, and she described being a telephone operator, managing different channels and connecting different people. And through this, she meets teams who can create components and uh, that other teams end up using. She'll help them write down the learnings from them and share those with other teams who can benefit. Stephanie told me that herding cats is actually a term of endearment. She said that the best relationships of her life have come from mobilizing the masses. At Salesforce, when a big push would happen across different product surfaces, she would go and tap the shoulders of people on system and product and platform teams. And she described that even in the trenches of a large scale effort, there's this beautiful sense of camaraderie, watching everyone come together. She said that the bonds were so strong between these people that those who worked together a decade ago are still in touch to this day. Job number five, leaders need to communicate value. Communicating value means leaders have to articulate the role and the impact of design systems to many different stakeholders. This includes understanding the economic value of your team and the value that you're bringing to customers. Leaders like Lauren describe this as being one of the hardest jobs. The truth is many design systems go unnoticed. Executives have no idea how much work it is. You can't compare the work of systems team to a team like growth or flagship product. If the foundational work that we do like color tokens lands, success is often measured by the fact that customers didn't notice the change. And often this work has a longer time horizon. So how do we tell that story? Jared mentioned that at Shopify, they tie metrics to systems work that the business cares about. So they'll create component coverage dashboards, kind of have a Google Lighthouse view or contribution dashboards to assess engagement um, and even ways to track active maintenance. At GitHub, Diana talked about writing newsletters about the work being done in the design systems org, which the head of the company would actually read every week. The goal was to make the design work more visible and start to spread that work upwards and sideways and even within the design systems team. In communicating value, having alignment with an executive sponsor or manager is key to success. And Allison at Zendesk said that having someone with a shared understanding who sees the same impact of design systems as you do means that you're not going it alone. Lastly, be sure that you're communicating outcomes over outputs. Measuring the amount of components made or the amount of teams using them isn't as influential as telling stories about the impact of the work. For example, did the system increase people's ability to use your website because we introduced accessible patterns? Did new hires onboard onto their teams with more confidence and deliver quality work faster because we trained them to use the design system? Being able to tell stories like this in ways that tap into the emotional and functional value of the system is more powerful than the numbers by themselves. Last job, job number six, leaders need to grow the business. Design system leaders have to be able to align their outcomes to the business. And that means working closely with people that are setting the vision and the strategy and laddering the goals of the design system up to the company's key objectives. Part of the way leaders grow the business is by figuring out how to become a multiplier or a dependency for business success. I once worked at a company focused on international expansion. With working with business leaders, I was able to align the system's work on typography and global language support to the business goal, making the company's expansion efforts dependent on our team's work. Mirko shared with me how he tied their design system to IBM's push to becoming a platform ecosystem, which positioned the system as core to the provider experience for first and third party offering providers who were delivering products to that platform. He said that the easier, faster, and cheaper it would be to deliver the platform, the larger the ecosystem would grow and the more customers that they would attract. There are several different audiences who need to understand that relationship between your team's work and the business vision. The first are the teams delivering outcomes, and those are the people that your team is usually collaborating with. The second are the leaders. Those are people coaching and guiding those teams. 
The third are the business executives who make investment decisions. And lastly, the operational leaders who are creating and transforming conditions within the organization. As Allison from Zendesk says, it's also important to make sure that people on the systems team understand the business strategy and how the work that they're doing fits into a bigger picture. So doing these six jobs well enables design system leaders to demonstrate the impact of systems and how it extends far beyond one library or tool their team maintains. And as these interviews show, design systems have the ability to transform how the entire organization works together. So let's keep doing these jobs and dispelling the design system myths that we know just aren't true. Where do you wanna take your career next? Are you hoping to pursue a role where some of the jobs I shared uh, today are included? If so, the leaders that I spoke with have some advice for you. Look for where the holes are. If you're able to sell those holes as an actual problem, then you can put yourself in a position to fix them. In order to affect change, think more broadly, not just your team's area, but things that impact all teams. Lindsay described doing research to learn that at the time, most teams at Lyft didn't have the confidence in their ability to follow WCAG guidelines or build accessible products. She also knew that Lyft as a business had VPATs and compliance requirements that they had to meet. By understanding the gaps and taking that data to leadership in order to fund the initiative, she was able to get more support. And I've heard of multiple companies who did this, first with accessibility, where they would bring one to two people in, and then they would be able to scale an entire accessibility team. Find a coach. It's really helpful to have outside support and a neutral perspective. Jules at Credit Karma said that this can help you be proactive and start the right conversations with your manager. This person could be somebody formally trained, but even starting a coaching circle with a peer group of other design system leaders outside of your organization can help be a really effective way to level up and help others. Don't confuse team size with influence. That's a trap and the wrong way to frame growth. Allison from Zendesk shared that growth comes down to impact and what successes you can point to the team having had a hand in. It's harder to make teams efficient Whereas small teams, big teams efficient, whereas small teams can move faster and still make a big difference. Study how decisions get made and the experience that people have making decisions. At IBM, Mirko says that he looks for people who understand decision workflows. How are decisions made? How are they contributed? How are they reused? How are they governed? How are they learned about? Making that workflow easy to do and conducive to good outcomes is what he calls system lifecycle work. You can't do a cookie cutter approach to, approach to design systems. What works for one company doesn't necessarily work for another. You have to build the system that meets the needs of the team and the company and the product and the scale at that time. Diana at GitHub shared that as a systems leader, you can also apply that same logic to organizational design and to leading a team. My advice is if you're in an organization that struggles to reward design systems leadership and promote systems people into higher levels, don't give up. There are periods in our, our careers where no matter what you say, people just won't get systems. Maybe that's because systems require a tolerance for some degree of complexity. There will also be other times where we'll have incredible advocates who not only get systems, but also invest in us and our teams. And there's some peace in knowing that that's an endless cycle that's not completely in our control as stakeholders come and go throughout the years. So as I wrap up, I'd like to share three big ideas that leaders offered about how to address these issues that they faced on their journey to design systems. First, having a distinct career path for design systems. A lot of organizations split different scopes of work and responsibilities for product design, design operations, and brand design. And in calibration sessions where managers are assessing these levels, people working on design systems are often calibrated against their peer product peers. And this leads to scenarios where, for example, a manager might be advocating for a product designer and highlighting the fact that they're doing product thinking that aligned two to three teams on a single project that led to moving a key number. They'll get a lot of nodding heads. Meanwhile, another manager highlights how a system designer is doing system thinking to align eight to 12 teams on multiple projects that lead to quality improvements on several cross cutting features. Yet, it's not always clear to others why they're operating at a high, higher level than their peers. 
when systems people get into senior leadership, they've had to show so much diplomacy, thinking holistically across the entire company, not only about the products, but thinking about what it means to be an engineer or a designer at that company. They also know how each team operates and how to operate with each team. They're truly someone who's an expert in connecting dots and handling tough, tough situations. Specializing in knowing all the pieces and parts and the end-to-end -end journeys, knowing how teams work together, and making decisions about all these things is truly its own craft, and it deserves to be valued as much as any other discipline. The second big idea was imagining design systems as its own organization within the business. This comes from the challenges of positioning a design system. When a system team reports up through a business or a function, other businesses or functions think that it might not be for them. Instead of having the systems team report into a chief design officer or a chief technology officer or the VP of some business unit, some people imagine organizing the system under a chief operating officer or a chief of staff. The remit of that org might be about operationalizing organizational excellence and delivery. Imagine being the team that exists and lives in all these spaces where people are building and shipping. We would research scenarios with different organizations where we might learn, hmm, in this situation, teams didn't have enough time. Or in that situation, there is a big organizational constraint. And this enables us to say, okay, well, what would it take for that not to happen again? And let's operationalize a solution to that. So what would it be like to have a true design systems org that tackles some of these bridge problems? The third idea that I want to share builds on the last one, and it's about design systems for good business. If you believe, like I do, that design system teams are capable of operationalizing organizational excellence, then they need to work with business leaders to define what organizational excellence is in the first place. Which begs the question, if we spent so much of our time defining what good design is and good engineering, then maybe we can work with others to define what good business is. This might be one of our biggest opportunities. There's currently lots of talk about rethinking the business. For example, the triple bottom line is focused on people, planet, and profit. There are many ways of making organizations that are more harmonious with the world around them. And a business's first instinct is to fit additional dimensions into the framework, in this case, adding people and planet to profit. So for example, in our definition of good, maybe we'll say oh, we need to add some sustainability goals into that. But if we keep doing that, we're still going to end up with revenue at the top of the requirements hierarchy. We have to understand an organization itself in a bigger context, looking at the business alongside the communities that it operates in, such as the regulators that regulate them and the governments that they engage in. There are systems to be designed at every level that might reshape the systems that we make within our organization, such as how we make decisions about data and privacy or artificial intelligence and ethics. We're so embedded in these things that we can no longer afford to think about them. As leaders, we have control over how we apply systems thinking to solve any type of problem within an organization. It can be about making product experiences more cohesive. It can definitely be about helping design and engineering work better together. It can also be about training people in our organization to be systems thinkers. It can even be about making systems that help our customer support teams answer the phones, like my first job, or the designer of the customer support website. The sky is the limit. What I hope that you've taken away from my talk today is that the bounds of the system are only where you draw the lines for yourself, on your team, and within your organization. So where's the most impact that you can make inside or outside of your company with your skills in design systems? If you think design systems are still specific decisions related to components, you'll definitely still make an impact. But what if we keep going and continue to improve how we make other kinds of decisions? I think we're just tapping the surface of what we're capable of and what companies and users need from systems. And I'm excited to see what more will come of us as our practice both deepens and broadens its reach. We can have leadership without design systems, but we can't have design systems without leaders like you. Thank you so much to Vitaly and um, everyone organizing the conference, uh, the Smashing Meets today, as well as um, just, you know, everyone today for coming and joining my talk. Really appreciate it. 
And thank you so much, Haley. That was very insightful. Um, that's, you know, it's very, well, that was incredible, really. Uh, what's really interesting for me is that I remember having, having these conversations maybe, I don't know, five, seven, eight years ago. Where we just thought about, okay, let's just have this little style guide and just call it a day and that, that would be it. And then we kind of moved to this world where now we are really dealing with this complex world of design systems and how do we define leadership of a design system? What skills does it need? And it's just an incredible evolution, I think, uh, happening in place here. Uh, one question that did come up in the chat is when you are, let's say, a leader or working in a position where you're running a design system, is there a particular good size for your team to own it or is it, is it very difficult to answer? Is there a particular, uh, I mean, how, when do you actually start thinking about splitting it into some subsystems or how would you even go ahead and say, organize a work around, I don't know, um, maybe 10, 15 designers? Does everybody have to be on board in design system or how would it be, how would the team be built? Yeah, that's a, um, I think that, you know, what I've seen is that the, in speaking to some of the, the people that I interviewed, it tends to be the case that uh, in, in the journey there, it starts as, you know, a systems team of one that maybe grows into, um, you know, a, a, a team of, of, of a handful of folks over time. And then there becomes this point at which that that group of people is oftentimes then responsible for decisions and assets that have impact on many teams. And mm -hmm. as that starts to happen, you start to see uh, those teams, uh, those, those, those system teams either um, start breaking apart a little bit and start embedding across different areas to infuse systems thinking and system practices across the business. Um, and then in other ways, you start to also see them begin to split out that group where they've got, you know, design systems maybe focused on UI and UX and then adoption and tooling and, you know, a host of, um, of like backend infrastructure, all the kinds of things that have to do with the life cycle of design systems. Um, and so, you know, it's a natural progression, but like I said, I think it can start with just one person um, or two people that are, you know, really ambitious and and see opportunities and problems to solve, holes to fill, as I mentioned, um, with, right. within very small company. Yes, yeah, so I think that, that quote actually will stuck with will stay with me for a long time because this is I kind of was looking for a way to phrase what I was trying to do uh, most of the time, and that's pretty much nails it. Um, there was also another question that came up. Uh, I have so many prepared, but I think that uh, uh, I'm going to bring this one, and then one thing we'll have to wrap up for now. Uh, Juho is wondering, you suggest that design systems is, or a design system is its own craft, not directly comparable to what product teams do. But previously, I have heard it's a good practice to rotate design systems people to product teams and vice versa for better alignment. What do yeah, you think I absolutely think that that's a great idea. There's a lot of different models out there, like what's being talked about, an embedded model, a rotation model. Um, and I, I think that uh, that, you know, the, the practice of that is enabling us to cross pollinate our skill sets and, and, and um, learn, learn from each other. Uh, what it what it's like to to work specifically on a on a focused feature or product set, and then to have and that's kind of like you thinking big and small. That's kind of zooming in, right? And then having other people on the team zooming out and saying, okay, how does that feature connect to an entire end to end experience that we don't own as one team? We actually have to work with other teams, and how do we do that? And that's where the system mindset comes into play, um, and the scale comes into play. So giving everybody the opportunity to practice those different altitudes of thinking and then you know again bring those bring those things um, not only to the system but also to the product work is is definitely um, a force multiplier for good decision making all right excellent well uh, thank you so much Heidi, for being with us uh, this has been incredibly insightful and i'm very very happy to and very pleased to have you with us um mm -hmm. thank you so much um and dear friends i mean maybe just one thing i can ask if i may Heidi, uh do you have a favorite animal oh um i love a good penguin i don't know if there is a penguin emoji i think what about emoji. a frog I mean, I'm sure there is a frog. I mean, what is the world without a frog emoji? Right. So, dear friends, uh, please uh, plug in the chat either the penguin emoji or a frog emoji, whatever you find more convenient for the, um, you know, at your keyboard, right at your fingertips. Uh, thank you so much, Haley. Um, this has been a pleasure. Thank you.